Look, I would totally understand if you tell me that you're just a bit overwhelmed when it comes to building client and server-side communication because we have so many options at our hands. And let's take a look at which one of them would fit your case the best. So we're going to start with the REST architecture. And the important point here is that it's an architecture. It's not a protocol. It's not a schema. It's not a language. It's an architecture. And it's OG. OG stands for original gangster. But what I mean is that everybody's familiar with it because it's very similar to object-oriented programming. So for example, you want to fetch the user data, you can have users in your URL. And if you want uh, to fetch the specific data of a specific user, you put user slash ID and you fetch the data for this. So what are the good things about REST APIs? Well, the reason they're so widespread is because they're so easy to build. So a developer can build a REST API in a minimum amount of time. The problem about the REST API is that they don't scale that well. So they create this coupling between the backend and the client. So whenever the backend changes, 99% of the time, the client also has to change and vice versa. And from my experience, if you have a separate backend team and a frontend team, this kind of cr creates a toxic rivalry between the teams because each team has to adjust to other teams' requirements. Another important problem with REST APIs is the thing called overfetching and underfetching. For example, when you're fetching the user data, if you want to fetch only the age of the user, but the user object is big, you're going to get all the data of the user. You're going to get the name, you're going to get the surname, you're going to get the profession, but you only want the age. So it's not easy to do that. You would need to create a new endpoint and vice versa, underfetching. If you need more data, you need to go and edit your API to supply you more data if, you, if your client needs more. So you see this? So what can we do here? Obviously, try something else, namely GraphQL. GraphQL is not an architecture. It's not a protocol. It's a query language. So QL stands for a query language. And the cool thing about GraphQL is that it eliminates this under underfetching, overfetching issue. So you fetch only the data that you need, which is pretty neat. Also, this creates kind of a contract between your backend and the frontend team because you define a pre, you have a predefined schema by which you're able to supply your client data from your API. Just by looking at this example, you can see that on the right, when we have a REST client, you have to do two multiple requests to fetch, for, first of all, the, the album assets, and then you need to supply an asset ID. While on the left side, we can see that you can do all of these two things in one query, which in fact saves us the bandwidth. So we don't have to replicate our endpoints. And let's say if, for example, you had a website and a mobile app that they can talk easily to one endpoint. And in case of REST API, your mobile app obviously needs less bandwidth because you care about every extra kilobyte that you're fetching, especially if it's some kind of an edge device like refrigerator, you really care about your data that you're fetching versus the website. So it's really hard to implement this in REST. And most likely you're going to have to develop new endpoints for your mobile app and your website so that they're talking in parallel. But with GraphQL, you can overcome this issue easily because you can easily determine which fields you need from your API. Okay, so what are the downsides of GraphQL? I could identify one big downside from my own experience is that it's very hard to get GraphQL right. If there's one condition that you have a, a really good GraphQL guru in your team who knows a lot about GraphQL, or maybe that's you, then go for it. Because as long as you have a good schema defined on your backend, as long as you have set up everything well on your front end, your GraphQL communication will be perfect. But I've seen teams doing this wrong. And another downside of GraphQL that I personally ran into is the GraphQL's client libraries like Apollo. They're very complicated and it's very hard to get them right. They have it, their own built-in caching system with write query and so on. So just to make an, an ordinary HTTP request, you have to write a lot of boilerplate code. And since it has its own built-in caching system, which doesn't play that well with your browser's native caching system, you usually run into weird bugs. So bottom line, when should you choose REST APIs versus GraphQL? If you have a very complex data representation, let's say you have a users, then your users can have playlists, plays, plays can have assets. So a very big nest object, data objects that you're, that you're sending around, go with GraphQL. It's not easy to do that with REST and you're gonna end up with a lot of overhead. If you care about bandwidth, so if you have mobile users or if you have some edge devices that care about every kilobyte transferred over the network, go with the GraphQL because you can select specific data that you want to fetch. If you're a startup that needs to iterate very quickly and you need to be able to 
find developers very easily and you don't have much time, go with the rest. Okay, now what is tRPC then? Well, RPC stands for remote procedure call, while T simply adds TypeScript to it. Now, before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor, Namecheap. I thought I've already told you about this, but apparently I haven't. So I'm gonna have to tell it again, I'm sorry. You can host your website for under two bucks a month. Yes, and this is real. So on top of that hosting, you're also gonna get an SSL certificate, which means your connection with the server is gonna be encrypted. You're gonna get a 20 gigabytes of space on your disk, you're gonna get a 24 hour customer service and a free domain. How cool is that? If you also agree that it's cool, then do we have a deal? Well, if you're still not convinced, here's the thing. You can get a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you don't like it, you can get your money back. Now, I guess we have a deal, right? And now back to the video. The main idea behind TRPC is that it brings backend and frontend much, much closer to each other, especially if you're using JavaScript in your server and the client, namely TypeScript. So behind the scenes, imagine your server has routes and controllers that are responsible for handling routes, right? In your normal Express.js app, this is how it works. So in TRPC, your client is gonna be able to call exactly these controllers as if it was one application. So they're really coupled to each other. And on top of that, you have a TypeScript which adds a schema, so there's really no way of supplying wrong data from your client to the backend because there's TypeScript that defines an exactly typed schema for both of them. And usually when you're using tRPC, it's very common to use a monorepo. If you already have a monorepo, you're lucky, and if you're using TypeScript and on both of your ends, you're lucky. Otherwise, try to use a monorepo for tRPC because your client is gonna be able to import exactly the same schema that your backend has defined and simply call it. So otherwise, if you have a REST, you can slowly migrate it. But if you don't, then it's up to you whether you want to rewrite your application to TRPC. So what are the advantages of TRPC apart from the fact that it's strongly typed? So TRPC runs on top of HTTP2 and it has a lot of out of the box uh, optimizations and capabilities that's gonna make your code unique and very close to each other. So this is definitely a nice thing. And it's very lightweight compared to GraphQL, of course. Another cool thing is that your IDE is automatically gonna be able to redirect you from your front-end code to your backend if you press Control right left click on one of your functions that you're calling from your front-end. I'm gonna make a separate video going into details of tRPC and looking into the code and how it can work with React in another separate video that's gonna come out in a week. So make sure you subscribe if you're interested. Also, tRPC has a much lower bundle size and it doesn't suffer from this bulky packages that GraphQL forces you to install on the client and your server. So when should you use GraphQL versus tRPC? tRPC unfortunately does not fix the problem when you need to request only specific data from your API. So if you have nested data and complex data, you have to go with GraphQL. If you're caring about your bandwidth, you have to go with GraphQL. And when should you choose REST versus tRPC? Well, if you're already using JavaScript on both of your ends, and especially TypeScript, you can go with tRPC. And last but not least, gRPC. Here we replaced T with G, and G here stands for Google. So Google Remote Procedure Call. Again, it has the same concept as tRPC, which means they're gluing your client to your server, and your client is able to invoke specific functions of the server as it was one application. And also gRPC does not work with JSON. It works with its own binary format called protobuffer. It makes some things a bit different. So first of all, gRPC really requires the client to tap into its HTTP2 capabilities because gRPC really works much faster than anything else. But modern browsers, even the modern browsers, are still not able to do that. So you need to install a gRPC web package to be able to do that. But if you need gRPC simply for your microservices to talk to each other, gRPC is the right way. Also, you can use gRPC over tRPC if your microservices are written in different languages, for example, in Java, in Go, and Node. So you're not only limited to TypeScript and you can still use the same functionality that remote procedural calls give you. This idea was actually already before we had REST API. So it's an old concept. GR uh, RPCs, remote procedure calls, are not new. But the thing is, Google managed to really optimize them. So if you really care about lower bandwidth, because 
gRPC is working with protobuffer and it's much faster to communicate and make transactions, go with gRPC. If your microservices are written in different languages and you also need to make this communication between microservices optimized, go with gRPC. If you care about bandwidth and real-time streaming because gRPC is able to do that, go with the gRPC. But again, it doesn't work as GraphQL because it's a completely different concept. And also, unfortunately, gRPC is not as mature as you would expect it to be. Maybe it will be in two or three years, but at the moment of this video, it's not. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please smash like and feel free to write me any comment down below. I'm gonna try to answer it as always. And I will see you in the next video.